We explore the past to understand the present and inform the future. Carnegie scientists explore the outermost reaches of space, the mysterious depths of the Earth, and the origins and mechanisms of life. Our scientists are chosen for unique skills and boldness. Their amazing discoveries, spanning more than a century, demonstrate the power of freedom. Carnegie investigators are intrepid adventurers who pursue their goals even as they mentor and train the next generation of scientists. They are free free to question, to wonder, to creatively pursue ideas from the vast universe to the subatomic world. We explore the past to understand the present. Carnegie Science. Before I begin our introductions, I'd like to thank Margaret and Will Hurst for their generous support of tonight's program. Because of them, people all over the country are watching, and internationally, are watching along with us at this moment on Facebook, YouTube, and our Carnegie website. My additional thanks goes to all the individuals who have contributed to Carnegie Science when they registered for tonight's event. We're pleased tonight to co-host our Capital Science Evening Lecture with the NASA Astrobiology Program. So before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to invite Dr. Jim Green, the director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, to say a few words about their great programs. Jim. Thank you very much, Matt. You know, before the space age, everything that we learned about the solar system we got from the back end of a telescope or from meteorites that fell down on the ground that we collected, but we had no context and no real understanding how they were created and where they really came from. But as the space age really kicked off and started going, we started in the 60s and 70s to fly by our planetary neighbors to even orbit a number of those and it was in that era that NASA literally created the discipline of planetary science. And this is where a combination of scientists, earth scientists, atmospheric geologists, geophysicists, began working together in doing comparative planetology. Many of those scientists, of course, came from the Carnegie Institute really a lot of good, solid Earth uh, uh, scientists that were then using the knowledge that they had obtained by understanding and studying the Earth and extrapolating that in doing comparative planetology. As the program matured, what the space agencies were starting to do was land, rove, and return samples. And this entered a new era of sophistication, and a new discipline was created, and it was called astrobiology. And in that, starting in the 90s, we began to bring together chemists, biologists, in addition to our planetary scientists. And even now, more recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, our astrophysicists that are looking for Earth-like planets well beyond our own solar system. And once again, the Carnegie Institute played a major role, being one of the first major nodes in our Astrobiology Institute, making major progress in this area. This is an exciting time. Have no doubt that we're making major progress in looking for life beyond Earth. You know, I've told a lot of my planetary scientists in the field that I want to be the director of planetary science when we find life beyond Earth. So tonight, we're taking that next step forward. What have we learned? What is the knowledge that we're gaining from these steps that will answer the question, are we alone? It should be exciting. Thank you for coming along for the ride. Matt. Thank you, Jim. 25 years ago, astronomers began finding planets orbiting stars outside of our solar system. Carnegie scientists at our Department of Terrestrial Magnetism here in DC have made many important contributions to their discovery and characterization. 
wondering if life might possibly exist on any of these planets, people naturally compare them to Earth with its blue skies and seas, a pale blue dot in the cosmos. Over time, as knowledge of the number and diversity of exoplanets increased, so has our understanding of the kinds of environments, including what we view as extreme environments, might support life. As the title of tonight's lecture makes clear, it is possible that life might exist on planets that are not like Earth. Our guests tonight, Dr. Jada Arney and Sean Domagal Goldman, are NASA astrobiologists who study Earth when it was young, when it too was not like the blue planet we know today. Their work has helped scientists to better understand how to detect and characterize exoplanets that might harbor life. Dr. Arney and Dr. Domagal Goldman are research space scientists at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. They are also associated with NASA's Virtual Planetary Laboratory at the University of Washington. The VPL is directed at answering one question. How would we determine if an extrasolar planet were able to support life or had life on it already? Dr. Damagal Goldman joined the laboratory after earning his PhD in astrobiology and geosciences from Penn State University in 2007. He became an astrobiology management postdoctoral fellow at NASA headquarters in 2010 and moved to Goddard in 2013. Dr. Damagal Goldman was one of Dr. Arney's advisors at the University of Washington, where Dr. Arney received her PhD in astronomy and astrobiology in 2016. Their collaboration was cemented in 2014 when she won a NASA Astrobiology Institute Early Career Collaboration Award that enabled her to spend time at Goddard. Both of our presenters tonight have assumed leadership roles in the astrobiology community and both feel strongly that communicating publicly funded science is a responsibility and a joy. At Carnegie, we believe that communica communicating science to the public to ensure that the link is made between discovery research and what it means to society is vital for all scientists. In fact, we are currently putting together Origins, a four-part program funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York that will address questions like, how did we get here, where are we going, are we alone, and what does that mean for humanity? I'm looking forward to tonight's presentation and to further exploring with our speakers, Earth's place in the universe. Now, some of you might surreptitiously actually be life from another planet, and we understand that, and we'd like to honor and welcome you. Would you please stand up if you... Okay, it's okay. They're very shy, often, yeah. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Jada Arney and Dr. Sean Domagal Goldman. Wonderful introduction, uh, and thanks to Carnegie Science and NASA for hosting us tonight, and, and to Dr. Green for the support he's given the astrobiology community, and actually myself, part of that resume, you, you might have noticed I was Dr. Arnie's advisor at one point, Jim Green was the boss in the, the division I was a postdoc in, so it's a, it's, a, it's a family and affair tonight. Tonight we'll be talking about pale rainbow dots, the search for other Earths, so keep that title in mind as we go forward and, and as you think about what you just heard from, from the introductions this evening. But I first want to start off with just a little vignette. You know, this is something that happens often in DC. You're at a soccer game or a barbecue or out at the bar. You get on an airplane and somebody asks, well, what do you do for a living? And I used to say, I look for aliens. But I could tell that that's what people had in their mind or this or depending on what generation they grew up in, that or that. Um, when, as astrobiologists, what we're really talking about is the search for this, okay? You live in a microbial world. Microbes have dominated our planet, not just biologically, but geologically and chemically as well for almost the entire rock history of Earth. So when we talk about looking for life elsewhere, we're not necessarily looking for little green beings, although we'd be happy to find them. That would, that would count as a success. We're really looking for little green microbes or little purple microbes. We'll get to that later. So when we talk about are we alone in the universe, especially when we're doing it from the standpoint of NASA, scientists in particular, what we're trying to do is think about ways to turn this into a testable hypothesis. We build up models of how biology interacts with its environment to produce signals 
that we could then measure or look for with spacecraft and their instrumentation. And this happens in myriad environments. But it starts here on Earth. And everywhere we've looked for life on Earth, whether it's the driest place or the hottest place or the coldest place or the deepest parts of the ocean or the deepest parts of Earth's crust that we've dug within, we find life, so long as there's a little bit of liquid water. And that's why you might have heard NASA make press release after press release. It's almost a joke in our community, but we found water on Mars again. Now, part of the reason for that is we're finding greater and greater evidence for greater and greater amounts of water in the history of Mars. And that's why we send rovers there to explore that history. Because one of the questions we're answering when we ask the question, did Mars ever have life, is if it did, how did it lose that biosphere? And if Mars did not have life, despite the presence of liquid water on its surface, why not? So that's why we send rovers there, to build, to, to make the measurements that test the predictions we're making of what life would do in that sort of localized environment on the surface of Mars, or might have done in the history of Mars. And eventually we're gonna try to get samples back from that little part of the cosmos. So we don't just have, I, I, I call this like CSI Mars, right? This, this rover has everything in it you'd want in a crime scene kit, except the crime scene it's investigating is like three billion years old, and the culprit might be a bacterium, right? But what we really want is we don't want just one lab. We want all the labs of Earth to have access to the Martian surface. And the only way you do that is if you bring Mars back home. So that's the next step there. For Europa and the other icy or ocean worlds of the outer solar system, we're answering a different question because these worlds, as you just heard, they might have subsurface oceans, but they're subsurface, they're locked under the ice. So if we look for life on Europa or Enceladus or any of these other icy worlds, the second question we're trying to answer is, can subsurface biospheres exist? We're kind of testing that hypothesis, if water, therefore life. If, that's, if that hypothesis is true, we should find life in environments like these. And it might be, we again catch a little piece of Europa. Maybe we investigate it in orbit with a clipper, Europa clipper type mission. Maybe eventually we bring some samples of Europa or Enceladus water back home, again, to analyze with everything we have here on Earth. But I think when we ask, are we alone in the universe, a lot of times people really personify that we. If you want to think about looking for the favorite sci-fi character you have, or species, if you want to have the same revolution for inhabited worlds that we've had in planets, right? So we, Dr. Green was talking about comparative planetology. If you want to do comparative astrobiology, you need multiple worlds that you can investigate. And the only way we're going to do that is if we go beyond our solar system and look for Earth-like worlds in the universe. When I was a kid, we were taught in school about the nine planets of our solar system, because at the time, Pluto was still considered a planet. And now, if you were to go into a classroom and ask kids how many planets are there, they will tell you that there are eight planets, since poor little Pluto has since been demoted. Although I still love you, Pluto. But both of these answers are wrong because they both vastly underestimate the total number of worlds that are actually out there. On October 6, 1995, we learned that our solar system is not alone in the universe. There are planets orbiting other stars. And the first planet orbiting another star that was discovered was called 51 Pegasus b. This was the first exoplanet. Exoplanets are what we call worlds that orbit other suns. And the discovery of 51 Pegasus b has opened the door to a revolution in a new kind of planetary science, which is the study of planets beyond our sun different kinds of planets than the ones that are in our solar system. We now know of thousands of exoplanets. This animation shows just some of the planets that were discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope, overlaying on our solar system. There's an astonishing diversity of planetary types and planetary system architectures out there that are not represented in our solar system. This animation shows what some of the Kepler exoplanets would look like if they were all orbiting our sun. And the dense, buzzing swarm of planets that you can see here really gives you a sort of visceral sense of how many worlds there are out there. When you think about the 
moons, and the planets of our solar system. Every single one of them is absolutely unique, with its own unique characteristics and own unique history that has shaped the way we see it today. When we consider then the thousands of exoplanets that we currently know about, and the hundreds of billions, with a B, billions of planets out there in the Milky Way galaxy that we have yet to discover, the possibilities for what might be represented out there are truly breathtaking. And this has affected how we look at the night sky. When we look up at the sky and we count the stars, what we now know we're also doing is counting planetary systems because we now know that most stars have planets. The night sky is teeming with invisible worlds. One of the most exciting recent discoveries in exoplanets is the TRAPPIST-1 system. You may have heard about this system when it got a lot of press coverage back in February when it was announced to be a seven-planet system. I actually got to go to NASA headquarters and participate in some of the social media surrounding this event, which was really, really fun. TRAPPIST-1 is a seven-planet system with seven rocky planets orbiting a very dim red star that's about 40 light years away. And what that means is that it took about 40 years for the light from that star to reach our telescopes. Now, if you've been following any of the news about TRAPPIST-1, or if you followed it when this announcement came out, you may have heard some people describe some of these planets as potentially Earth-like. But that's a really loaded term that conjures up very specific imagery. What do we actually mean when we say some planets might be Earth-like? And more importantly, what do we actually know about the planets in this system? Well, to answer that question, I want to talk us through how we actually go about finding exoplanets, because the answer to that question will fall out of this discussion. We use two main methods to find exoplanets today. The first method is called the radial velocity method, and this is the method that we use to discover the first exoplanet, 51 Pegasus. The radial velocity method takes advantage of the fact that as planets orbit stars, they actually tug on their stars with their gravity, causing stars to wobble just a little bit. And we can measure that wobble with our telescopes to infer the mass of the planet that's doing the tugging. And by how frequently the star is wobbling, we can learn things about the orbit of the planet. The second method that we use quite successfully in recent years is the transit method. And this is the method that the Kepler Space Telescope uses to discover exoplanets. The transit method takes advantage of the fact that as planets pass directly in front of their star from our point of view, they produce little eclipses, little what we call transit events, blocking out just a little bit of the starlight. And by measuring how much light gets blocked out, we can infer what the size or the radius of the planet has to be. And by how frequently the transit events occur, we can learn things about the planet's orbit. And this was the method that we used to discover the TRAPPIST-1 planets. Now, both of these planets are very useful for exoplanet discovery. But notice how with neither of these methods are you actually seeing the planets directly. Instead, you have to indirectly infer that the planet must be there by how it's interacting with its host star. Because you're not seeing the planets directly, the kinds of information that you're able to obtain about these worlds is inherently limited to very basic properties, like the planet's size and the planet's orbit. So what do we know about the TRAPPIST-1 planets? Well, we know how big they are, and we know how far away they are from their star. And that's enough to give us some information that really intrigues us, but it's not enough to tell us what these worlds are actually like. If we want to know, are these planets actually Earth-like? We need more information. One of the tricky things about the TRAPPIST-1 system is that they're orbiting extremely close to their star. And their star is really active. It shoots off a lot of flares and high-energy radiation into space. And this is problematic when you have these little planets huddling up close to that really active star. So it's possible that due to stellar activity, the atmospheres of these planets have been stripped away to space. Maybe they don't have any water at all. And this is a testable hypothesis. But in order to test it, we need more data on this system. And we need new kinds of observations that have not yet really been applied to small Earth-sized exoplanets, like the planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. 
do you, how do you find a habitable exoplanet? How do you confirm its habitability if all we know of are its size and its orbital properties? So you really can't. For that, you need more information. And that information is going to come from far away. We're not planning, at least in the near term, to send rovers to the surface of the Trappist worlds to collect samples and send them back home. So everything we're going to be doing is with a telescope. How can you tell if a planet's habitable, if it has global oceans, if you're only doing remote observation, and how can you look for life? Well, we can actually use Earth as a guide for this. This is a whole disk image of Earth taken by NASA's uh, Discover mission, the EPIC camera on board. And you can clearly see, as we all have in these images of Earth ever since the, the, the Apollo era, the oceans and the continents and the clouds. And in this particular movie, you can actually see the eclipse from this summer moving across the United States. So that tells you a lot about the habitability of Earth, including that it has a moon. And that's all done remotely. That's not done by digging up a sample of Earth and sending it back home or to wherever that alien lives. Not just oceans and continents you can see from space. You can also remotely observe the life we have on Earth. These are images or, or data from NASA's SeaWiffs uh, mission, which can track the chlorophyll and algal blooms in our oceans. And we can also track the growth and shrinking of forests over seasons on land. What this means is that if you want to do measurement remotely, you can figure out where the oceans are, or which planets have oceans, I should say, and which oceans have life. Now you can't just see, it's not only that you can see the organisms, you can also see what they're putting into the atmosphere. And we're all breathing carbon dioxide out right now, as are many cars and factories across the globe. And NASA's Orbiting Carbon Observatory can track that carbon dioxide. So not only can you see the organisms on the surface from remo remotely, you can also see the gases that organisms produce. And, and this gas in particular, as we all know, is a greenhouse gas. So that also has a bearing on the climate of the planet in question. Now, for all of astrobiology, one thing we've learned is that the environmental context is important. On Mars, that environmental context is the rock that that microbe might be living on. In Europa, the context is the ocean the microbe might be swimming in. For an exoplanet, we're talking about a global biosphere. And so the context in that case is what the star is doing, the energy it's imparting to the planet. And sometimes the dangerous energy, as Dr. Arnie was mentioning, that could maybe strip the planet's atmosphere away. Now, that's something we can obviously also measure remotely, not just the star's properties, but also how it interacts with the host planet. And we're learning a lot about that from the heliophysics investigations we're doing looking at our own sun. Now, there's a challenge embedded in here, too, because uh, there's a saying, right? One person's data is another person's noise. So if you're a stellar astronomer, you love getting photons from a star. Now, this is not a mistake. This is showing the noise that the star imparts to the signal from the planet. There's a pale blue dot. We heard that in the introduction tonight, right? If you're far enough away from Earth, it's just a pale blue dot. That pale blue dot is somewhere on this screen. And unless you're one of the aliens that was too shy to stand up before and have some supervision, you can't see the pale blue dot. And the reason is your detectors are being overwhelmed by the light coming from the rest of this slide. Now, if we take that light away, if we block it out, you can see a pale blue dot. It was there all along. You just couldn't see it. If we don't do anything to that star, it will be 10 billion, again with a B, 10 billion times as bright as the planet that could harbor life orbiting around it. And even if we block out all that light from the star and still get the light from the planet, it will be one of the dimmest, if not the dimmest thing we have ever observed with our telescopes. So that imparts two challenges. One is to block out that starlight, and the second is to still collect enough light from the planet to learn something about it. How do you block out the light of an entire star? Well, if you were lucky enough to see the total solar eclipse that happened back in August and stand in the path of totality, it was amazing. You saw the moon doing just that to our sun. The sky gets dark and you can see stars in the daytime. And you also see this beautiful halo of light surrounding the moon. And that's a feature of our star that you can only see during a total solar eclipse. And you can see it in this image here. That feature is called the solar corona. The corona is the extremely hot and tenuous extended outer layers of our star that reach out into space for millions of miles. 
Normally, the corona is totally invisible to us because it is vastly outshined by the surface of the sun itself. In fact, the brightness of the sky, the blue daytime sky, is too bright that it outshines the corona. And so what you need to see is you need this fortuitous alignment of these celestial bodies. And you have to be in the right spot at the right time so that you can actually see the corona. Now, if you're a solar scientist who wants to study the sun's corona, you can't possibly be expected to just sit there and wait for a total solar eclipse to come to you, because that would be ridiculous. These things don't happen very often. So instead, what we do is we build something called a coronagraph, which is something inside of a telescope that does to the sun what the moon is doing to the sun in this image. This is a time-lapse video of the sun taken with the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, or SOHO satellite, which is a space-based observatory that, whose job is to observe our sun, as you might expect. I really like this video because it shows the activity of our sun. Our sun just doesn't sit there quietly. It's an active star. You see these coronal mass ejections. You see these beautiful filaments of the corona. And I also really like this video because that bright thing over there, that's the planet Venus. And those spikes coming off of it are the fact that Venus is a really bright source, and it's just spilling its light onto different parts of the detector. Now, I am a solar system planetary scientist, in addition to being an exoplanet scientist. I actually published my first scientific paper about Venus. So Venus is special to me. I, I love Venus. Um, Venus is my favorite planet in the solar system besides the Earth. <laughs> besides the Earth, I, I like to live on the Earth. I wouldn't live on Venus. And I think what's really cool about this, besides the fact that it has my second favorite planet and the sun in it, is the fact that it shows us the challenge that we face when we're observing exoplanets. If the coronagraph wasn't in place, you wouldn't be seeing any of that. You'd, you'd see a saturated detector that would be filled with the photons from the sun and nothing else. But since we have the coronagraph in, pla in place, which is that dark object in the center, we can block out the disk of the sun and allow these much fainter features to pop into view. So you might imagine that we could do this for exoplanets. Imagine having a powerful future space telescope that's equipped with a very sophisticated coronagraph that would be able to block out the light from distant stars and see those planets orbiting around them that are 10 billion times dimmer than them. This would be a phenomenal scientific and technological achievement. And it would allow us to directly image other Earths and try to understand what are they made of? What are they like? Now, unfortunately, the first images we're ever going to get of Earth-like exoplanets will not look like this. Instead, they're, they're going to be more like this. And even this is too optimistic because I have like a couple of pixels going across that little blue circle. And in actuality, we're just going to get dots. We're just going to get points of light on our detector. This is a very famous image of Earth, which is in the circle right there. That's our planet. This was taken by the Voyager spacecraft as it was leaving our solar system. And it turned around when it was 3.7 billion miles away and took this photograph of Earth. Carl Sagan called this photograph the pale blue dot and described our planet as a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam, which I think is so pretty and poetic. This is the kind of image that we're going to get when we get the first pictures of exoplanets. So what can we learn about a pale blue exoplanet dot? Well, we want to know, is this world Earth-like? And of course, we also want to know, does this world have life? And that's a lot to ask of a pale blue dot. But fortunately, we know how to do it. Because... There's another dimension of information that comes along with these pale blue dots, and that's their spectra. We're all familiar with how if you shine light through a prism, you can split it up into a rainbow of colors. And we can do this with our telescopes, too. In fact, we do it all the time. If you were to take sunlight and shine it through a prism and look at it very, very closely, very, you know, very, very, very closely, you would see that there are dark lines in the spectrum of the sun. 
These are called spectral lines or absorption lines. And what they're from is they're produced by compounds that are in the atmosphere of the sun absorbing light at very particular colors. Every atom and every molecule, every compound in the universe has its own very characteristic absorption spectrum. They all absorb light in very particular colors. So you can identify what something is made out of by looking for the absorption spectrum that it produces. For example, we know that there's sodium because we see the sodium lines. We know that there's hydrogen because we see these hydrogen lines. This is a science called spectroscopy, and spectroscopy is fundamental to modern astronomy. This is how we know what things are made of in space. You may have heard that the sun is mostly hydrogen and helium. How do we know that? Because we've never actually collected a sample of the sun. Well, it's, it's spectroscopy. How do we know what Jupiter, or Uranus, or Neptune are made out of? How do we know what Pluto is made out of? It's all spectroscopy. And spectroscopy is also how we've made the measurements that we talked about earlier. The way we know where carbon dioxide is in Earth's atmosphere by doing observations from space is by looking for those specific colors or wavelengths of light associated with carbon dioxide. Similarly, if you want to look for life on the surface remotely, you would look for the specific wavelengths of, li of light associated with chlorophyll, the pigment that bacteria use to harvest light for their energy and growth. Or you look for, on land, the colors associated with the physical structure of leaves. Essentially, you look for green. This is how we do it from space on Earth. And the question is, if you only have one pixel from this planet, can you still do it in a global sense? Let's pretend that you're an astronaut and you're in the far future and you want to go on an expedition to the nearest stars and you're so far away from Earth that even though you have a really powerful telescope, you can't actually see anything from Earth but a pale blue dot. But fortunately, you have a spectrograph attached to your telescope, which lets you take the spectrum of our planet. It's, it's chemical fingerprint. What could you learn about that Earth from its spectrum? One of the first things you might look for is water. An Earth's spectrum is a wash in features from water vapor. Water is central to our definition of planetary habitability, and it's probably one of the first things we're going to look for when we search for signs of habitability on exoplanets. You could also look for greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are like a blanket in our planet's atmosphere that trap heat and keep the planet warm, similar to how this blanket is keeping that kitty cat warm. If you could quantify the abundance of greenhouse gases in the planet's atmosphere from its spectrum, which we know is possible, it, it's hard, but it's possible, then you could feed those abundances into climate models to try to predict what is the surface temperature of this exoplanet likely to be. Because it's important to know what the surface temperature of the world is to understand the stability of liquid water on the planet's surface. And you could even look for signs of things like geological activity. Volcanic activity produces characteristic gases like sulfur dioxide that you can see in a planet's spectrum. You might even see things like volcanic ash in a planet's spectrum. And all of these processes and things that you can look for are fundamentally important to understanding planetary habitability and how habitability is maintained over long timescales. But of course, Understanding whether a planet is habitable is a different question than understanding whether a planet is inhabited. How do you actually go about detecting life on that pale blue dot? Well, as Sean alluded to earlier in this presentation, when we're talking about finding life on exoplanets, we're not necessarily talking about intelligent life or even complex life or even macroscopic life. If you look at the whole history of life on Earth, for most of Earth's history, life has been microbial. If you were to go back in time to Earth's past, to most of Earth's past, you would need a microscope to know that there's any life forms there. And so what this might suggest is that microbial life may be common in the universe, at least relatively more common than more complex life. Maybe it's easier to evolve microbes, and maybe they stay microbes for a long time. 
Maybe there are loads of exoplanets out there that have entirely micro-based biospheres. And so if that's the case, which we don't know yet, but if it is, we have to be prepared for that. How do you detect microbes across interstellar distances? It's, it doesn't seem possible, right? But it is, because life in some ways is a planetary process that can modify its environment on a global level. And microbes are actually really great at doing this. And in fact, all of us in this room right this second are taking advantage of that fact because we're breathing oxygen. And the oxygen that we're breathing is produced by life. It's produced by oxygenic photosynthesis. If you were to magically shut off all oxygenic photosynthesis all at once, the oxygen that we're breathing would not stick around very long, geologically speaking. You need oxygenic photosynthesis in order to have an oxygen-rich atmosphere. Most of the oxygen in our atmosphere is actually produced by microbes. It's produced by a class of organisms called cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria evolved billions of years ago. About 2.5 billion years ago, oxygen levels in our atmosphere started to rise. And so the oxygen that we can detect from our planet's spectrum is sort of a way that the cyanobacteria have been saying, hello, we're here to the rest of the universe for about the past 2.5 billion years. Now we can look for other biological gases, for example, methane. Methane, most of the methane in Earth's atmosphere is biological. And it's, I know people associate cows with methane, but it's actually microbes in the guts of cows that are producing the methane. They're called methanogens, and they live in all sorts of places, including hydrothermal vent systems, and yes, the guts of cows. So methane is another, you know, it's another biologically produced gas. It's another metabolic byproduct that ends up in our planet's atmosphere and produces a detectable spectral signature. We call these special gases biosignatures. And fundamentally, the search for life beyond Earth is a search for biosignatures. Now, one of the challenges with biosignatures isn't just figuring out the things you want to look for that life does, but ruling out the ways that nature could trick you. Another way of phrasing that is, it's easy to find life, but it's really hard to prove you found it. And this is the image that I think captures that really well. This is the thing that keeps me up late at night. As our first astronom astronomers were detecting the first exoplanets, another group of scientists was claiming that they had found the first evidence of life beyond Earth in this rock, which once was on the surface of Mars before it came to Earth, landed in Antarctica, and then was dragged off to our labs where we analyzed it, and then put out a paper and had a press conference saying, we're not alone because of the chemical and morphological features in this meteorite. Years later, after the scientific community turned its attention to this with tremendous scrutiny, as, as a claim like that deserves, I think the consensus in the astrobiology community today would be that yes, there are data, lots of data in this rock that are consistent with the presence of life, but there's nothing conclusive because there's non-biological processes that could describe every single one of those data points. And so the question is not just what are the things that life does to the environment on a global scale that you could detect, but how could you rule out the non-biological processes? How can you make sure nature doesn't trick us? For exoplanets, curiously enough, the answer is pizza. And the reason, sorry Nationals fans, I'm, I'm a Cubs fan too. The, the reason the answer is pizza is you have to imagine this auditorium being full of college students and a line of college students going out the door and they're all here because there's been an announcement that there's free pizza and an unlimited amount of it for whoever shows up. Now, if you saw pizza in that room, you could ascertain that there was a pizza restaurant nearby. And the reason is the students are gonna eat that pizza and it's gonna be gone. And more students are gonna be right outside the door ready to eat more pizza. The only way you maintain the pizza that's constantly being eaten is if you're constantly delivering it to the room. You need a pizza restaurant for that. It's the same story with oxygen and methane, both made by biology, but both lead to reactions in the atmosphere that destroy each other. Right? You can pick either one to be the college student, either one to be the pizza. The point is, they're constantly destroying each other. And so to keep them in the atmosphere at the same time, you need to constantly replenish them. Right? So instead of a pizza restaurant, you're in this case ascertaining that there's biology there. And I can think of ways that you could chemically make oxygen in an atmosphere. I can think of ways you can make methane at a seafloor. 
but I cannot think of any way that you can make either of those gases fast enough to keep them in the atmosphere together. And it's, it's an or, it's, this is not like a factor of two problem, this is an orders of magnitude problem. Biological production of these gases is orders of magnitude faster than non-biological processes. As long as they're being destroyed, you need to replace them. Now that's how we'd find, or at least we're planning to find, Earth-like life on other worlds. But in those thousands of planets we found around other stars, we found tremendous surprises. That first exoplanet that was found, that was a gas giant. It was bigger than Jupiter and closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. And we thought those things shouldn't exist, and it actually kind of confused us at first because they were so contrary to our expectations. If you asked astronomers maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago about planets bigger than Earth and smaller than Neptune, you, they would probably tell you that they're, they're likely rare. Turns out they're the most common thing we found in terms of planets beyond our solar system. And astronomers also thought that it would be impossible to get a planet orbiting a double star system. We have two stars orbiting each other at the center of the system and a planet orbiting. We said That's, that would make it for a nice sunset, but it'd be impossible. Maybe we were looking at the wrong source literature. <laughs> but maybe we weren't expecting the unexpected enough. And the lesson here for astrobiologists is we're talking about aliens on alien planets. Shouldn't we be thinking about alien signals? Now to do that, we have to take all of the lessons we've learned about biology and its environment on Earth and think about it in the different environmental context of its host star. And that's where we start thinking beyond the pale blue dot that we have here today. If you change the color of the star, if you make it really dim, plants might want to get their pigments on every single photon of light that comes their way. So instead of being green, they might be black, absorbing all light hitting them. If your star is very, very bright and it gives the plants too much energy, they might overheat. So they might actually reflect away a lot of light and end up really blue. In addition to the pigments that make algae in our oceans blue-green, there are, there are microbes that use purple pigments, and sometimes those are paired with certain, certain ocean chemistries. So if you have a different ocean chemistry, your planet might be purple because there's purple bacteria growing there. Or if you had massive continents and you weren't nutrient limited, you could have global forests or something like Endor in the Star Wars movie. I don't expect that, but I didn't expect Tatooine either. So instead of a pale blue dot, you might look for a pale gray dot or a pale purple dot or a pale green dot or let's call that one a pale really blue dot. Now, there's a happy medium here between us taking what we've learned on Earth and knowing exactly how that planet operates and thinking about these alien biospheres that we're kind of making up in models that are based on Earth, but we're really going a far ways away from the modern day Earth that they were originally designed to simulate. The happy medium comes from Earth history and actually from Dr. Arnie's own research. The Earth through time is really useful for exoplanet science because it offers us a perspective on different kinds of environments that are both habitable and inhabited, so the holy grail that we're looking for in the exoplanet population, but they're different from the planet that we live on today. And so we can use them to broaden our understanding of what it means to be habitable. If you were to get into a time machine, like the TARDIS or DeLorean or whatever time machine is your favorite, and go back three billion years ago into the past, you'd have a really bad day because you would asphyxiate really, really quickly because there is no oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. There, there was extremely trace quantities of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere back then. So unless you brought a gas mask with you, bad day, very bad day. We think that during that time period, there was a lot of other gases in the atmosphere. There was a lot more carbon dioxide. There was a lot more methane produced by life. And methane can do some really interesting chemistry in a planet's atmosphere. If you have an atmosphere that's really rich in methane, which we think early Earth's atmosphere may have been, you can trigger the chemical formation of this sort of orange smoggy haze that would have blanketed our entire planet. And it's not something you'd want to breathe, but the microbes that lived in that environment back then were perfectly happy. They did not mind. This planet that you see on this slide is hazy early Earth. This does not look like the Earth as we know it. 
This looks like a completely alien world. We like to say that this planet is the most alien world that we have geochemical data for. This planet is the pale orange dot. And so we can add that to our sort of repertoire of different colors that are showing up not quite as orange as I would have hoped on that screen, but that is the pale orange dot on the end. So thinking about Earth's history and thinking about what might be possible in the exoplanet environment is really instructive when we're trying to think about what might be possible out there. These planets with these different photosynthetic biospheres were dreamed up by thinking about how photosynthetic organisms might respond to changing the host star that the planet is orbiting. And you can also think about changing the chemistry of the planet. The chemistry in early Earth's atmosphere is fundamentally different from the chemistry that occurs in the atmosphere of modern day Earth. If you have an atmosphere that's very rich in methane, that's a different kind of chemistry than an atmosphere that's very rich in oxygen. And it leads to the buildup of different sort of atmospheric signatures and biosignatures that you might expect. And so thinking about these different processes, the host star and planet interactions, what happens in the atmosphere from you know, chemical interactions, what happens with gases that are being outgassed, what happens with the gases that are being outgassed by life, what happens with plate tectonics and recycling of those gases, what happens with the chemistry in the oceans. This is really complicated. We have an unofficial motto in the research group that Sean and I are part of, the Virtual Planetary Laboratory. And that motto is, planets are hard. And they are very hard. Yes, they are extremely hard to model, especially when you throw biology into the mix. But we know how to do it, and we certainly know where to start, because we know how to model our own planet, and we already are studying our own planet. And everything we've learned about our home planet not just from the history that Dr. Arnie talked about, but our observations with spacecraft today. These are the, the spacecraft we have up right now observing our own environments here on Earth. Has brought about a revolution in our understanding of how planets work. It's called system science because you have to think about those complex interactions, not just what the life is doing, but what it's doing in its interactions with the atmosphere and the oceans and the chemistry and the rocks and the interactions of those things with each other. Now, because of the power of comparative planetology, we've taken that to other worlds and tested our theories and, and advanced them even further by putting them in the context of Mars and Venus and all the other worlds of our solar system. Now thinking in that planet environment context, we've also started to think about how all of that would be impacted by a sun or an alien sun that has different properties than our own. And we have astronomers that are telling us about the wild properties of stars that are vastly different from the sun and the surprises we've gotten from exoplanets we've discovered to date. Now the challenge is, I, I don't think, I really don't think the smartest person in the world could do this stuff. I think a bunch of the smartest people in the world working together can do it. And the challenge is forming that community and that's one of the things NASA's trying to do with something called the Nexus for Exoplanet System Science. We're taking that same revolution on, in understanding Earth and its climate that has been applied to planets in our solar system and trying to apply them to these other worlds. But it takes all of those disciplines, not just the Earth scientists and the planetary scientists, but also the heliophysicists that understand the, the physics of the sun and its interactions with the Earth and Earth-like worlds, and also the astronomers that give us that environmental context on the planet-wide scale. Now, if we do all that, we'll have models predicting what living planets and dead planets look like. And those models predictions are what we'll be testing with future telescopes. Now, unfortunately, we can't actually do these kinds of observations yet. We really want to observe Earth-like exoplanets, but we can't do it yet. But we're going to take the first steps in that direction with the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, pictured here in the clean room at NASA Goddard, which is launching into space in 2019. You notice how the mirrors are gold colored. They're not the color of telescope mirrors that you're used to seeing. The reason why they're gold is because this is a primarily infrared telescope, and gold is a really good infrared reflector. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to revolutionize multiple areas of astronomy. It's going to answer questions that we didn't even think to ask before we built this telescope. That always happens when we launch a new great observatory. It answers questions that we didn't even dream up. We're going to, for example, study the earliest galaxies and how they formed with this telescope. 
And we're also going to be able to use this telescope to study exoplanets. In particular, we're going to be doing a lot of great science on really big, puffy planets with really thick atmospheres. Think of like Jupitery thick atmospheres, puffy things. But the thing about space-based telescopes is it takes a really long time to design them and to build them on the order of decades. And exoplanets are babies in the history of astronomy. This, this is a young field. And this telescope wasn't designed for exoplanet science. Exoplanets are just, they're just young in the history of astronomy. And so while we're going to be able to use this telescope for exoplanet science, absolutely. It's, it's going to be hard to characterize small things with this telescope. And that doesn't mean we're not going to try. Of course we're going to try, because the payoffs are enormous. For example, one of the reasons why we're so excited about the TRAPPIST-1 system is because this system is amenable to observations with James Webb. So we could use this telescope to try to characterize the atmospheres of these worlds, if they have them, to try to discover, are these worlds Earth-like, or are they something completely unexpected? Do they even have atmospheres at all? And this will be technically challenging. This will be extremely time consuming. And this will push the capabilities of our observatory to the limit. But I work with so many creative and brilliant people who are constantly coming up with these amazingly creative ways of pulling signals out of noise. So I think we can do this. I think we can do this. But I want to do more than just this. I want to find dozens of Earth-like planets, and I want to know, is life common or rare in the cosmos? And in order to do that, we need something more powerful that's designed for exoplanet science. Sean and I are both part of a team at NASA Goddard that's studying a potential future space telescope concept called LUVOIR, which stands for the Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Telescope. Long acronym, not very creative. Astronomers are constantly coming up with the most creative acronyms in the world. Very descriptive. But LUVAR will be amazing, and it will be huge. Um, it has a proposed mirror diameter of about 9 to 15 meters in diameter. So how big exactly is that? Well, um, I'm about 1 and a half meters tall, and the distance between Sean and myself right now is about 2.4 meters, which is about the diameter of the Hubble Space Telescope. The primary mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope is about 6.5 meters in diameter, or this distance. And the primary mirror of LUVAR <laughs> would be about this distance. So that's really big. <laughs> really, really big. In fact, when we got into this room and we actually figured out <laughs> that it was just about the length of the room, I was like, wow, that's going to be a huge telescope. <laughs> and there's a reason why it's so big. And the reason is because Earth-like exoplanets are so faint. And if you want to collect enough light from them to say something meaningful about them from their spectra, and not just you know, one planet, but do this for a lot of different planets at great distances away from Earth, where they're very, very faint. You need a really big light-collecting bucket. And so that's what that giant mirror is. It's a big light-collecting bucket. And it gives us what we require to efficiently characterize small, faint things orbiting distant stars that are 10 billion times dimmer than their suns. Nominally, we'd be hoping that this telescope, if it's selected, because remember, this is a proposed mission concept. It's not actually a mission yet. But if it were selected, we would hope it would launch in the 2030s. Now, I just started my career as a civil servant at NASA Goddard just in January. And I've basically been working on this telescope since I got there. So what this means is that if this mission is selected, I will basically be devoting my whole career to it, which I am 100% OK with. I think Sean is okay with also doing that. <laughs> I'm really excited by the science that this would do. It would do all sorts of amazing things for galaxy formation and stellar formation, and also phenomenal solar system science. For instance, if there's geysers on Europa, this thing could image them and monitor their activity. But I'm really, really excited about the exoplanet science that this could do, because this observatory would be designed 
to search for signs of habitability on potentially dozens of Earth-like worlds nearby. If there's a habitable exoplanet in the nearby universe orbiting a star that Louvoir could image, this observatory would find it. And if there's life that's modifying its atmosphere and leaving spectral signatures that we can detect in the nearby universe on a star that Louvoir can see, we're going to know about it. We're going to find it and just a couple decades away. The question of are we alone in the universe is a testable scientific hypothesis. And we're on the brink of actually being able to test that, even for worlds that are dominated by microbes. When we look up at the night sky, we now know that we're also counting planetary systems and not just stars. And I like to imagine that in the not too distant future, we'll also be able to count living, breathing worlds and know that we're not alone in the universe. But thank you. That is the end of our show. So we welcome questions at our two microphones here. Please uh, line up if you'd like to ask some. We'll start over here. <laughs> I think I can't answer that question because we haven't actually discovered planets that we know are Earth-like. I think we'll be able to answer that in the future. I'm confident, but I am... <laughs> so uh, for, for those that don't know what Fermi's paradox is, it's this Enrico Fermi physicist question. Like he was sitting at lunch one day and he's normally very talkative. And one day he was very quiet and his, his colleague said, what's wrong, Enrico? And he said, where is everybody? <laughs> and the idea is if, if the universe is teeming with aliens, they should have visited here by now. But, but there's, a, there's a critical component to it, right? He's, he was imagining human civilization 2,000 years from now. Certainly, he thought, we will have colonized another star by then. And 2,000 years after that, each of those colonies, us and the, the Alpha Centauri colony or Proxima Sen colony or whatever, would have also formed their own. And, and pretty quickly in the scale of geological time, you colonize everything, including Earth. So where are they? My personal favorite solution is that it assumes exponential growth and everything we know about, about biology and ecology on every spatial scale says that exponential growth is inherently unsustainable. Now, 20 years ago, scientists would have said, we blow each other up with nuclear weapons because that's what we were worried about then. And now we're worried about sustainability as a science community. So there's a bit of a bias to my answer. But right now, that's, my, that's probably my favorite. And to sort of answer your question, my current favorite exoplanet is Proxima Centauri b. I'm really excited <laughs> by that planet. I like that planet. Mm -hmm. It okay. has problems for habitability, but it's also cool. Uh, thank you. M my question concerns Titan. There are liquid ethane and methane seas on Titan. Is anyone thinking about what the biological signal would be of, mm. of life that's based on a completely different chemistry, where it's not water liquid, but it's some other liquid? So yes, people are <laughs> thinking about that. I am not a biologist, um, but I know that people are trying to think up ways that the universe can make different kinds of life. Of course, so it makes sense to s at least start with life on Earth because we think we understand life on Earth pretty well. And so we start by thinking about what are the properties, you know, what are, what are the fundamental requirements of life on Earth? And one of those requirements is liquid water because water has a lot of really good characteristics that are unique as a solvent. And so thinking about other kinds of solvents, like these lakes of liquid ethane and methane, yeah, they're, they're interesting. Chemistry in them would proceed very, very slowly, though, because they're so cold. Do you want to yeah, add to that? Five years ago, I would have said... It, it, it takes a smarter chemist than myself to figure <laughs> out how that life would work and what signals it would make. And it turns out we've got some smarter chemists in, on Earth. Um, and, and in particular, um, there's people like Sarah Walker and Lee Cronin mm -hmm. that are thinking about how, if you look at the family of chemicals that exist in the environment and the network that they create, both the complexity of individual molecules and the complexity of the network that they form, 
might be substantially altered by biology, and that's not something that would be subject to carbon-based or water uh, solvent-based life. That might, that might and should, I think, transfer to any kind of life that exists. <laughs> I, 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 th I think the, the, the formal response to this is we've got uh, uh, United Nations agreements on how we interact with planetary environments beyond our own. Or how about Oprah, would that do? Or Oprah. <laughs> uh, but actually, I wanted to follow up on that other question. Yeah. Isn't it more likely that, um, I mean, we call this life, but life is really what we call life is an adaptation to the conditions of our mm -hmm. planet and the elements that exist. Now, in another place, you've got very, very different you know, conditions. Mm -hmm. You may have other elements that we don't even know about. And if you get a situation where something does develop a system and does progress and does evolve, and possibly even evolves into some level of consciousness, isn't somehow that even more possible? I mean, protoplasm is very de delicate. <laughs> so you got a lot, so there's a lot of parts to that question. <laughs> we know what the elements, we know what the universe is made out of, and we know what the most common elements in the universe are thanks to spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is awesome, I love spectroscopy. So we know that some of the most common elements in the universe are the stuff that we are made out of. So carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, which, oxygen. Which one am I missing? <laughs> <laughs> hydrogen, thank you. <laughs> we call these the sponge elements because we, we love making things into acronyms. We know that these elements are ubiquitous in the cosmos. And that, that doesn't mean they're the only things you can make life out of. So, you know, you, maybe you have arsenic-based life. Maybe arsenic is substituting for phosphorus somewhere in some alien biosphere. But I think it's likely that life is going to make itself out of common things that we know are cosmically common, things that we're made out of. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean this is the only way to do it, right? We, we, ha we haven't actually tested this question. This is a hypothesis that we could test in the future. We, we can't yet do it. Um, I'm just There's, saying there yeah. could be even other elements. Sure. <laughs> sure. Okay, we, we could test that someday. Hi, thank you. I just um, wanted to talk a little more about the technology of direct imaging of uh, exoplanets. You spoke about the coronagraph. You spoke about your mission concept. <laughs> but I do know that um, coronagraphs that we have right now don't have the resolution capable of... Uh, <laughs> imaging Earth-sized planets. And uh, how close are we actually to developing a coronagraph that could actually, is anybody working on that? That's my <laughs> part one. Second one is the, uh, you spoke of a, a little bit about, about the star shade technology. Like, how is that filtering in into future missions? Thank you. I'll, put a, I'll take the coronagraph, okay. you take the star yep. shade. Does that work? <laughs> yep. So the, we're actually building a telescope right now, NASA is, that, w that has a chronograph on board. It's called WFIRST. It's the next flagship mission that would happen after JWST. And it has already, before it's even launched, dramatically under uh, advanced our understanding of how chronographs work and our capability to build ever more sophisticated chronographs. Um, and that's slated to launch in 2025. And when it does, we'll learn a lot more about how chronographs work in a space environment. And I, I really don't think the stuff we're talking about doing the decade after that would be possible were it not for that mission. Um, do you want to take the star shade? Yeah. So um, I, I love star shades. Um, I, <laughs> I worked I worked on um, with a advisor, Webb Cash, who thinks about star shades all the time. When I was an undergraduate with my friend Julia, star shades are cool. They have a lot of advantages in some ways compared to coronagraphs. They they let you see more of the whole planetary system at once compared to coronagraphs that let you see a more narrow slice of most planetary systems. So with the star shade, you can actually see 
much, much more um, sometimes than with a coronagraph. The tricky thing about starshades is they're so I should actually explain what a starshade is. A starshade is a, is a it's like a, it's an occulter. It's, it's a big disc. Um, and in this case, it actually has these petal shapes around the edges that are mathematically defined to suppress starlight from coming around their edges. So this is like a coronagraph, but it's a giant sort of a, you can think of it as a giant coronagraph floating out there in space. So Here's a telescope, and here's the starshade, and there's a bright light over there. And so you put the starshade between the telescope and that bright source, and you use it to block out that starlight. You know, just like the moon did during the eclipse. You could think of the moon as a starshade. The tricky thing about starshades is they're big and they're far from their telescope, and so you have to steer them great distances around the sky in order to get to different targets. And so you have to think very carefully about which targets you're going to look for and how much fuel you have on board to steer them around. And there's another mission concept that NASA is currently studying yep. called HABEX, which is a habitable, uh, habitable exoplanet imaging mission that Sean is formally associated with and I'm also starting to do some work for. And HABEX has a starshade as part of its concept in addition to a coronagraph, which I think is a really cool and novel way to do this problem because starshades and coronagraphs each have their own advantages. So if you put them together, you get something that's really awesome. So yeah, I like star shades. Okay, Ivan. Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on a marvelous lecture. Um, having put so much thought into how to explain fairly simply some very complex science is not only wonderful for the audience, it must be wonderful for you because you can't hide behind uh, obscure mathematics and jargon when <laughs> you don't explain things. Anyhow, that, that's fabulous. <laughs> that's obscure, but not mathematics. Um, but my, <laughs> my question has nothing to do with exoplanets. It has to do with Louvoir. Yeah. I cannot imagine something that's going to do everything from infrared to ultraviolet on a 10 to 15 meter telescope that's going to be devoted to any one topic like exoplanets. Yeah. It seems to me that every scientist in the world must be trying to get that mission. How are you going to talk? What are you going to do with this? How are you going to schedule it? How are you going to yeah. keep it from you know, everybody getting 30 microseconds a year because <laughs> there are 2 billion people who want to get on it. Could you, I know it's another lecture, but can you talk a little bit yeah, about it? Yeah, so I, 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 this is a great, great question because it's really about how we do science as a community, especially when we're making a big investment in a single observatory. The diversity of science, not just with exoplanets, but as, as Jada was mentioning, um, general astrophysics as well as solar system science, you need to be able to do all that if you want to motivate a, a flagship scale observatory like that. I think how it would be used would ultimately be determined by the community itself in the phases leading up to it, but the way we've been talking about it in its sort of conceptual phase it's in now, is we would have some dedicated time to find some of these exoplanets. Um, just as you might have a dedicated obser observation sequence with any observatory for a, the, the key ship, the, the, the key pro uh, program. But once we find them, the spectroscopy we do on them would go into a guest observer program just as well as any other proposed, you know, observation of a galaxy or a planet in our solar system. Does that? Yeah, but next related question. Uh, it's not just the spectrum. How far are you looking? How much time are you integrating? Is everybody going to want to put a completely <laughs> different instrument on this piece that is incompatible with everybody else's missions? Just <laughs> configuration control just sounds mind-boggling on me. <laughs> it so ain't easy. It's not easy, and I mean, we're, we're studying this. So we, we have these models that can tell us how long you do have to integrate on to see a target at whatever distance you want to put it at, how much of the spectrum you're going to get, because how far away it is and what kind of star you're orbiting will give you different amounts of information from the planet spectrum. And so this is, this is something that we're actively simulated. We're actively trying to address, you know, what, what is the yield of this observatory? How many exoplanets can we actually find in the amount of time that we're going to schedule? We have, you know, we're going to have a certain amount of time that we're scheduling for these observations. What's our yield? And you know, how do we design the observatory to maximize our yield? And, and if, you had, if this were a lecture about Louvoir itself, <laughs> you probably would have had an astrobiologist and in my place, maybe a general astrophysicist to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, Jada mentioned HABEX. One of the differences between those two, they're both going after similar science. HABEX is designed to find these exoplanets primarily, and then you get whatever astrophysics you get out of that uh, 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 telescope, that observatory. Louvoir is being designed with exoplanets and general astrophysics as 
equal partners in the and endeavor. And solar system as well. And solar system. We can't do something just to maximize our exoplanet yield or, or spectroscopy return at the, at the expense of the rest of astrophysics. The idea behind LUVAR is it for it to be really an observatory for the entire community. And that's where the trades come in that we want to make sure that you're not making one instrument super efficient and compromising the performance of another one. And we've got a, a wide variety of scientists on board a science and technology definition team to help guide Goddard, who's doing the study and the, the design of the mission, uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. Two more questions over here. What do you have to do to protect these uh, huge mirrors from mm. solar winds and solar flares so that they don't degrade quickly? And the second question is, how within the space science community do you manage the competition for limited monies to do these things <laughs> between the kind of science that you want to do and the kind of science that some other people want to do, which sends humans to Mars? Who wants to start? <laughs> uh, you so, um, with, as far as interactions with the sun, I mean, the, the big thing you don't want to have happen is um, telescope getting super, super hot from the sun. So there, there is a sun shield that we have on board the mission. Um, when you, when you saw that video with that big giant thing unfurling, that's that's the sun shield. It's about half the size of a football field, and so that protects it from from sunlight, basically. In terms of the second question about setting community priorities, I mean, Chada and I are biased. We, we love astrobiology and we love exoplanets, right? So we really are motivated to do the thing that combines those two things in a single mission. But it's really up to the community of scientists and ultimately to our elected representatives in Congress and in the White House, and not just over one administration, right? So if you talk about politics of science and on this scale, something that's not gonna launch until 2035, it's not about who's in these positions today, it's about the series of people we have in those positions over time. If the science community decides to prioritize this kind of thing, and our nation decides to prioritize this sort of thing, we're, we're, we're already signed up. If we at the science level or at the national level decide to prioritize something else, we'll follow another passion. I mean, we're civil servants. It's that we're gonna go where we're sort of, we're instructed to go over time. But we do have our biases, right? So. <laughs> and I'm a biologist and we're a bargain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So last question, thank you. Could life be comprised of dark matter? We don't know what dark matter is yet, so I don't know the answer to that question, <laughs> but I love how creative that question was. <laughs> okay, I'd like to thank our speakers again, and thank you all for coming. Inform the future.